Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for today's webinar on Helping Children Grow and Thrive, Opportunities to Leverage the Healthcare System to Prevent and Mitigate ACEs and Advance Equity in Childhood. For those interested, our slides will be available on the Families USA website as well as a recording of this webinar and a companion report. We encourage you to review our report as it provides more details and background on today's discussion as well as our full set of recommendations. To ask questions, please type your question in the chat box. We will answer questions at the end of the webinar. So we'd like to quickly introduce ourselves. My name is Shadi Hushiar. I'm the Director of Early Childhood and Child Welfare Initiatives here at Families USA and excited to join you for today's conversation. Hi everyone, my name is Sunny Sanchez. I'm a Policy Analyst here at Families USA. So this webinar and the companion report are the product of the Center for Health Equity Action for System Transformation at Families USA. The center is the only national entity exclusively dedicated to the development and advancement of patient-centered health system transformation policies designed to reduce racial, ethnic, geographic uh, inequities. We focus on advancing equity while improving outcomes, increasing value, and lowering costs. We do this by catalyzing and coordinating action to develop and implement health equity focused healthcare delivery and payment policies. We achieve impact by partnering with and supporting community leaders, health equity experts, and other stakeholders at the national, state, and local levels. On today's webinar, we'll review what we know about adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, as well as data that shows that exposure to early adversity is not equally distributed in the United States. We'll talk about the role of historic, systemic, and institutional inequities, and specifically racism, as a source of and fuel for ACEs, and highlight the opportunity in leveraging health systems to prevent and mitigate ACEs and improve health equity. We'll then share several of our recommendations for this work. So the original ACE study, which many of you may be familiar with, was conducted in two waves of data collection by Vincent Folletti and colleagues from 1995 to 1997, surveyed over 17,000 Kaiser Permanente HMO members about childhood exposure to 10 adverse experiences, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, emotional and physical neglect, whether one had a mother who was treated violently or lived with a family member who had mental illness, substance use disorders, or was ever imprisoned, and the loss of a parent to separation or divorce. The study sample was mostly white and middle class, which was a limitation of the study, and we'll come back to this later in this webinar. So we now understand that ACEs influence health and well-being, and we recognize the mechanisms by which ACEs influence health. This graphic provides the conceptual framework for the ACEs study, but it has evolved to recognize the role of historic trauma, structures and conditions, and the way that ACEs build on these existing conditions. Many of these structures are often punitive and embedded in racial bias, and they limit opportunities and come with built-in economic and social inequities. Recognizing this, the Rise Center in California has created a modified ACEs pyramid that highlights that trauma is historical, structural, political, and embodied. It also adds a number of important mechanisms and redefines the way risk is conceptualized in the third tier from the top. Risk-taking is typically a healthy part of development, but risk-taking in the context of chronic trauma and inequities often results in harm and burden. Also, many healthy risk-taking behaviors, like smoking and drinking, are ways for young people to cope with their trauma. The Rice Center suggests including coping along with risk, since it doesn't place a negative or positive value on the behavior. The Rice Pyramid also acknowledges the role of microaggressions, implicit bias, and epigenetics. As our understanding of ACEs continues to evolve, so will our recognition of the mechanisms by which ACEs influences health and well-being. We know that ACEs are common. Almost two-thirds of the original study participants reported at least one ACE, and more than one in five reported three or more ACEs. ACEs are highly interrelated. Most people with one ACE also have others. And in the most recent Burfus survey, 24% of respondents had at least one ACE, and 16% had four or more ACEs. 
The ACE score captures the cumulative negative impact of adversity on social, emotional, cognitive development, and other impairments in the function of the brain and body systems. These impairments are the biologic pathways to health risks, disability, disease, and early mortality. The short and long-term outcomes of these childhood exposures include many health and social problems. As the number of adverse childhood experiences increases, the risk of developing significant health problems also increases in a strong and graded fashion. Research has shown that the greater the child's exposure to ACEs, the more likely they are to experience poor health and social outcomes in adulthood. So more ACEs equals more risk for negative outcomes. But risk factors are not predictive factors because of protective factors. So for those of you familiar with the Strengthening Families framework, you may recognize this as the mantra of the framework. It's a compelling and important piece of our discussion on ACEs. ACEs do not destine one to poor outcomes. When children who are at risk of or have been exposed to ACEs can access a broad range of supports and services, from stable, safe, and nurturing families to access to healthy nutrition, stable housing, safe communities, early care and education opportunities, and high-quality schools, they develop powerful resiliency and the ability to achieve a healthy, independent, and productive life. Perhaps the most important protective factor in a child's life is the presence of a supportive, stable, and nurturing adult. Supportive early relationships offer protection from the effects of stress. Children's physiological responses to stress can be significantly reduced by access to their primary caretaker. In contrast, the absence of relationships can limit the brain's capacity for managing stress and its recovery. As mentioned, ACEs are common and all communities are affected by ACEs, but exposure and prevalence is concentrated in low-income communities, children of color, and other underserved and underrepresented populations. A number of reasons drive um, this disproportionate impact on these communities, including persistent historical, systemic, uh, systemic and institutional, economic, social, racial, and ethnic inequities that increase risk for poor health and simultaneously limit resources available to promote or improve health. This means, for example, that even at higher incomes, children of color experience a disproportionately high level of ACEs compared to white children of the same income level. It also means that the most affected communities are less likely to receive the resources they need to mitigate the impact of ACEs exposure. To quantitatively, uh, to quantitatively contextualize the disproportionate impact, one in three black children have experienced two to eight ACEs compared to one in five white children. 62% of children with family income under the 20, 200% federal poverty level experience at least one ACE. And adults who identify as bisexual, gay, or lesbian on average experience more ACEs than heterosexual adults. Overall, 61% of black children, 51% of Latino children, and 40% of white children experience ACEs as shown in the right side graph. Some of these structural barriers fueling ACEs include historical trauma and systemic racism resulting from federal, state, and local policies, as well as institutional practices favoring some communities over others that include, and no way is this an exhaustive list, the historical trauma of over 200 years of slavery for black Americans and boarding schools for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Um, this also includes the systemic residential con uh, segregation of communities of color from home ownership and the mass incarceration of black Americans, as well as institutional racism, which pervades healthcare organizations and affects provider care delivery and has impacted the disproportionate maternal mortality rates among black women and the lower rates of pain medication prescribed to people of color. These are some of the many factors at the root of contemporary inequities and that underlie and drive ACE risk. For this reason, addressing racial and ethnic inequities is foundational to mitigating and preventing ACEs. Research suggests that experiencing chronic racism and discrimination is a stretcher that contributes to health disparities. Racism can have both a direct and indirect influences on toxic stress and more and more is considered a far-reaching adverse experience at the neighborhood, community, and societal level. 
Further, because experiencing long-lasting forms of discrimination and racism wears a person down physically over time, this stress can also impact family and household well-being and compromise parenting, quality of the parent-child relationship, and family functioning, which then leads to toxic stress. Perceived racial discrimination, as well as the downstream effects of racism experienced by, another fam by other family members, can affect a child's health. One study showed that a mother's perception of racial discrimination were related to poor parental psychological function, which then negatively affected parenting, uh, parenting satisfaction and parenting style. One strategy to address um, ACEs is to leverage the healthcare system as a point of care. The healthcare system holds considerable financial resources and power that can be brought to bear to prevent and mitigate ACEs. The majority of children are seen regularly in pediatric primary care settings from birth into the early years. In fact, 88% of children enrolled in Medicaid receive pediatric well care in the first six months of life. This makes health care a, a nearly universal system and setting to address ACEs, including federally qualified health centers that provide an array of health and community services to 25 million people annually, and mostly to low-income families. This strategy also takes advantage of an opportune time in the life of children as early childhood is a critical window of opportunity to implement prevention and early intervention strategies. Additionally, as the healthcare system transforms to provide high value care, improve outcomes and reduce costs, more attention is being placed on socially determined barriers to good health that drive 80% of variation in health outcomes. This attention and investment into improving such things as housing, food security, access to educational, economic, and work opportunities, supports needed to create resilient communities, families, and children, recognizes that health is more than just health care and that it is influenced by so much of what happens outside the clinic walls. This, this creates an opportunity for the health care system to address social determinants of health and implement equity-focused strategies to prevent and mitigate ACEs. So now we'll move on to review 10 select recommendations on how to leverage the healthcare system to prevent and mitigate ACEs and to improve health equity. This is a high level presentation of 10 out of the 15 recommendations included in our report. Our first recommendation is federal and state investments and, in a, um, and scaling of home visiting programs. Families are more likely to access essential services if, if those supports are provided in places where families already spend time. These include such places as libraries, child care, schools, pediatrician's office, and of course, in the home. Home visiting programs are a valuable strategy to mitigate and prevent ACEs because they've been shown to promote nurturing relationships, reduce parental stress, and foster resilience those protective factors mentioned earlier that all growing children need. Investing in scaling home visiting programs has great potential to provide the proper supports to families with young children, and we know that there is great need. The McVie program has already helped many families, 48% of which were living in extreme poverty. Further, population data tells us that there are over 18 million families with children aged six or under, or have a baby on the way, but evidence-based models only reach a small fraction, 3% of families. We know that home visiting program, programs work. We recommend scaling home visiting programs requiring expansion of federal funding to sustain them. Community health workers, or CHWs, present a huge opportunity to improve health outcomes while reducing health care costs. Mounting evidence demonstrates the effectiveness of CHWs in addressing social determinants of health and reducing and eliminating barriers to good health for communities with the most need. However, lack of sustainable funding pathways for and lack of healthcare system integration of CHWs means that their value is not being maximized. As such, our second recommendation is to expand financial support for utilizing these frontline workers to coordinate care in pediatric health and other settings. Tied to the previous recommendation, CHWs have successfully delivered home visiting services. One example includes Healthy Start pro program Madrina, which linked pregnant Latinas to perinatal health care, health education, and support services. Pediatric interventions like Healthy Steps and Project Dulce also utilize CHW-like roles to support families in the healthcare setting. 
As a note, you can find more information about the number of pathways to sustainably integrate CHWs into the healthcare um, system in our report. Um, the societal and healthcare costs of maternal depression are too high to bear and to not adequately address. Maternal depression can negatively impact a child's development, impede their ability to learn, and has a lasting effect on a child's health and well-being if left untreated. Additionally, the consequences of untreated mood and anxiety disorders among pregnant women and new moms is expensive. A projection estimated costs of $14 billion for births in 2017. Recognizing the importance of addressing maternal depression, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services allows pediatric health care providers to bill for maternal depression screening during well-child um, visits and to cover treatment for maternal depression under the child's Medicaid benefit if the child is present and if the treatment directly benefits the child. As such, our recommendation is for state Medicaid agencies to allow pediatric health providers to bill for maternal depression screening and cover treatment under the child's Medicaid benefit. Currently, at least 25 states cover maternal depression screening in Medicaid well child visits. Colorado, North Dakota, Illinois, and Virginia go a bit further and cover maternal depression screenings under the child's insurance in the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP. Illinois, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and West Virginia also mandate that providers screen all women for prenatal and postpartum depression. Given the prevalence of maternal depression and given the limited care mothers from communities disproportionately impacted by ACEs receive, states not currently covering maternal depression screening and treatment under the child's Medicaid benefit should do so. We know that family-centered care and shared decision-making contribute to better outcomes, quality, and patient safety. Yet barriers rooted in structural racism and biases that influence attitudes, behaviors, policies, and practices of child and family-serving systems prevent many families of color from being true partners and leaders in their children's healthy development. Efforts to dismantle the intergenerational transfer of opportunity and disadvantage and to dismantle baseline inequities require a true shift in the power imbalance often seen in how systems engage with families. Health systems should partner with families and create space for and lift up the voices of families by, among other strategies, creating opportunities for shared decision-making with families at every level, including policy development, program design, and implementation, and partnering with and investing in parent and community-based organizations to support their ideas. The Center for the Study of Social Policy has developed recommendations for supporting equitable outcomes and parent leadership in early childhood systems. This is a great resource on this topic, and we provide a link to it at the end of our presentation. Implicit bias impacts our decisions and actions in an unconscious manner. In healthcare, it affects care in a number of ways with harmful consequences for underrepresented populations. Among the documented examples, marginalized populations, including people of color, are less likely to be prescribed pain medication, more likely to be viewed as non-compliant with their medication, and more likely to be viewed as medication-seeking. Studies have also found that implicit bias is associated with racial disparities in pain management in children. Our recommendation is that health systems and organizations setting policy for pediatric practice and quality improvement institute staff training on implicit bias. There are a number of examples of institution-wide efforts to implement implicit bias training in healthcare settings. We highlight several in our paper. Institutional racism refers to the structures, policies, and practices within and across institutions that influence the distribution of and access to resources, as well as the exposure to adverse risk affecting communities of color while concurrently benefiting white people. In healthcare, institutional racism affects coverage, access, care delivery, and other dimensions of care, resulting in higher disease rates and worse outcomes for minority populations. As an example, studies have demonstrated that care for people of color is concentrated in a small number of hospitals and that these hospitals tend to provide lower quality care. Where people of color live and receive care has been associated with disparities in care for a number of diseases and procedures. This is a direct result of our country's history of racial and economic segregation of communities of color. Institutional practices are responsible for less effective treatments for people of color and affect their quality of care. 
Remediating institutional beliefs and practices is imperative to eliminating health inequities. One potential approach that can surface and mitigate structural barriers in healthcare is institutional analysis, or IA. IA identifies standardized institutional methods like administration requirements, job descriptions, and employee training that may compound or produce poor results. It, pump, it pinpoints inherent organizational policies and practices, the very underlying structural barriers that contribute to inequities. One potential opportunity is to use hospital community benefit and community health needs assessments to implement and support IA. We discuss this more in our paper. For more on IA, you can see the link to resources at the end of this webinar. Today, we recognize that social, economic, and environmental factors influence children's health, and opportunities exist to promote population health by better connecting and integrating healthcare and social supports to address broader drivers of health outcomes. Several models use these strategies in pediatric settings and screen for uh, both risk and protective factors, concrete supports, child development, and parent functioning. Importantly, they also connect families to services, supports, and opportunities both within the clinic and the broader community. As an example, an evaluation of one such model, Project Dulce, showed that the program accelerated access to concrete supports for families like SNAP benefits and utility service supports. Our recommendation is that primary care providers promote population health by better connecting and integrating health care and social supports. As we've discussed, early childhood is a time of rapid growth and learning, setting the foundation for healthy physical, social, emotional, and behavioral development and academic success well into adulthood. It's a sensitive period for facilitating social emotional development, promoting cognitive and academic competence, and preventing long-term sensory problems, making it an opportune time for pediatric interventions. Interventions involving parents during the first few years can dramatically improve a range of parenting behaviors and strategies, and research suggests that it's also the transition to parenting is a distinct and important period for adults and a time when they are especially receptive to intervention. We know the value of multi-generational approaches, and data demonstrates that interventions that focus on parent-child relationships can mitigate ACEs. Recognizing this opportunity, pediatric practices are experimenting with programs that combine caregiver and child health care. We highlight several of these in our report. ACEs are often defined as exposure to 10 adverse experiences in the family environment. This narrow definition disregards the broader set of neighborhood, community, and societal level exposures, many of which we've discussed today. For instance, we know that early experiences of racism and discrimination, community violence, social isolation, and poverty have measurable and broad negative impacts on health. ACEs screening tools should be expanded to capture indicators such as social isolation and social determinants of health like racism and discrimination, food insecurity, neighborhood or community violence, housing instability, and poverty. In our paper, we describe several efforts to broaden the definition and screening for ACEs, including initiatives in Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and California. For more on parent leadership and institutional analysis, please visit CSSP. They have a number of great resources. So we'll now pause for any questions in the chat box, and we can start with any questions that were shared earlier. Okay, so for our first question, we the question is who is creating these analyses to ensure that they're not biased? Are they internal or independently being done? Uh, that, that would make a difference if the people who create the disparity are creating the analysis, no change will come. So I think um, the question is referring specifically to institutional analysis, and I'll let my colleague respond. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, for institutional analysis, yes. The analysis is conducted by a group of researchers, external researchers, with the involvement, um, and this is important, with the involvement of community members, um, and um, le uh, community leaders and business leaders, an array of um, state co community stakeholders to ensure that um, those disparities um, are uh, disparities that are um, being experienced by these uh, uh, people aren't um, 
uh, blinded or obscured by internal analyses um, by folks not experiencing these disparities. And I, from my experience, IA is actually typically done in public intervention systems like child welfare and typically done by outside organizations with uh, a grounding, a foundational grounding in health equity and in racial equity and in institutional analysis. And so they come in and they do this independent analysis and provide um, a report. Um, a couple other questions. Uh, where can we get uh, a copy of the PowerPoint? Um, I believe it's going to be uh, shared with everyone on the call shortly as follow-up. Um, and uh, I think we had also a question about the report, um, which will be released, um, I think, in the next uh, day or two. Um, and again, will also be circulated um, to everyone on the call and will also be available on the Families USA website. Um, we have a question about where, whether they're teaching about ACEs in medical schools. Um, I'm not sure you know, I can confidently um, answer that question, but I believe that it is being integrated into, um, at least to some extent, into learning um, in medical schools since the, the, um, this, this work and this research has been around for some time. Um, let's see, some other questions. So, you know, there are a number of uh, states that are thinking about and doing a range of activities to prevent and mitigate ACEs. Our focus was primarily on the healthcare system, um, and there are certainly examples of states that are engaging, um, you know, in terms of uh, innovations in the healthcare space um, and thinking about payment. Um, and system transfer and delivery system transformation. Um, we highlight some of those in specific areas um, with each of our recommendations, um, and you can find that in our report. Um, we did not look at. Uh, so the question is, did you look at interventions for TANF families, such as home visitation? We did not look at that. Um, I think that that's um, important, um, and I think it's it's uh, worth taking a look at. Um, and then I'm looking to see if there's any additional questions. Is it being intertwined with the education reform platform that is also highlighting equity for all? Um, so in terms of the, the ACEs learning um, and research, I believe that there, uh, there's quite a bit of this and, and certainly the, the focus around trauma and trauma-informed practice um, being integrated into to education um, practice and policy, um, if that responds, to, I think that responds to that question. And actually around ACEs, um, in terms of what states are doing, several states are actually looking at it within the context of um, waivers and sort of thinking about um, changes to their healthcare system and practices. So we have a question about docs for TOTS. Um, which I'm not familiar with, but um, uh, I assume that was a reference to um, one of the uh, opportunities to teach ACEs. Um, I think in medical science, I, I'm actually not familiar with the group, but. So if we have any additional questions, please feel free to post them. For us and for any that we haven't been able to answer fully, we're also happy to follow up. Um, I think we have a clarification on what is uh, CHW. Um, CHW is Community Health Workers. Denise, would you like to say any more about that? Yeah, community health workers is actually an umbrella term for a variety of lay workers, such as promotoras, community health representatives, even peer navigators um, that typically share cultural uh, background, linguistic background, or shared experience with the people that they are trying to help, and they typically provide um, they link um, communities with health services and um, uh, social services to improve health and reduce barriers uh, to, to good health. We have a question on what your thoughts are on ACE screeners. Um, you know, we have a discussion around screening for ACEs in our paper. 
I think there are a number of considerations when you're thinking about screening for ACE. One is that by the time you're screening for an ACE, um, in theory, the, the adversity or the trauma has already happened, um, and we need to really be moving much further upstream in terms of thinking about how we can prevent um, ACEs. Um, having said that, they are a part of a broader set of strategies that can be used to identify um, and mitigate um, early adversity, uh, toxic stress, and trauma for families. Um, we have some considerations around uh, strengths-based screening for uh, ACEs and other social determinants of health in our paper, um, and a conversation around prevention, which I just um, alluded to. And then we have uh, one just around sort of our understanding of ACEs and how the, the typical ACE screen is uh, this uh, cumulative sort of index and has this uh, sort of treats all ACEs equally in sort of an additive uh, index. And there is some uh, concern that uh, all ACEs are not equal um, or equally traumatic and that you know, when you're uh, screening for ACEs, you should be aware that they could have differential impacts on children stay attuned to those potential variations in how children experience ACEs, think about factors like timing, severity, duration of the adversity, as well as the presence of protective factors um, when you're screening for ACEs and identifying appropriate interventions. Um, and, uh, you know, making sure that as you screen, you're also looking for opportunities to strengthen linkages to services for families because, uh, you know, ultimately, um, the, the, the goal of screening is to be able to identify uh, needs, um, strengths, um, and to be able to better connect and link families to services both within the clinic and outside. And I'm looking to see if there are any additional questions. I don't think that we have any at this moment. If you've submitted one and we haven't yet responded, um, we'll be sure to um, to connect with you and um, answer any additional questions. Um, so we are going to wrap up um, our presentation. Um, again, thank you for joining us today. Um, and again, the link to our report and webinar recording will be shared with those listening uh, in the very near future. Please remember to visit our website for more information and resources. Thanks, everyone.